Okay, uh, welcome back to our video podcast series to everyone. I'm really pleased today to have our guest, Dr. Alex Mihalidis, who is the scientific director of the AgeWell Network of Centers of Excellence, which focuses on the development of new technologies and services for older adults. He's also a professor in the Department of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy and in the Institute of Biomaterials and Biomedical Engineering at the University of Toronto. He's been conducting research in the field of intelligent systems and health for the past 15 years or more perhaps, uh, with a specific focus on the development of intelligent home systems for elder care and many other accomplishments, which I will uh, highlight in the bio that I post on the website where you can read all about them. Um, but thank you so much for, doc for joining us today, Dr. Mihalidis. Oh, thank you, Janet, for having me. Thank you very much. So I just want to uh, start off by asking if you could tell us a little bit more about the AgeWell Network and the work that you do. Yeah, so AgeWell is a uh, what's called a National Center of Excellence. It has been funded through the federal government since uh, 2015. And we are a national network that supports the research and development, uh, commercialization, translation of new technologies or technological based services uh, to support older adults and family caregivers as well from you know coast to coast to coast. Um, another big aspect of age was also training the future leaders in this particular area. So not only training uh, you know future academics but also industry leaders, uh, policy makers, etc. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. Um, now, I want to transition to talking a little bit about some of the issues of interest to our health policy students, as this week we are looking at issues in long-term care. Um, and so we all know that the pandemic really shone a light on and also likely intensified some of the many already existing problems in long-term care homes. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could just share a few of the highlights of the problems that you've encountered over the years, what, which stand out to you as most important. Yeah, so I think, you know, one of the biggest issues we've seen in, in long term care, which really was exacerbated during uh, COVID was uh, social isolation. Uh, you know, many of these residents uh, do become isolated. Uh, they may not have uh, family anymore to visit with them. There is a lack of care staff who is able to really just sit down and, and socialize with these individuals, you know, because they're also busy, obviously, trying to, to care for them at the same time. And, you know, when obviously the pandemic came and there were no visitations allowed, et cetera, this became far worse. And, you know, again, there has been an official research done on this, but I would think social isolation was one of the, the larger contributing factors to the many deaths that we saw in, in long-term care homes. Yeah, we heard so many heartbreaking stories uh, in the media. And I think everyone who knows someone in long-term care likely yeah. has some real personal knowledge with that. And yeah, I know that, um, the CSA groups, what we heard report, which I'll be posting for the students, it highlighted the need to balance health and safety concerns along with those issues of isolation and yep. mental, social, and emotional well-being. In the face of COVID and other infections, how do you think we can get this balance right? Yeah. and. Um... You know, Janet, that was one of the biggest challenges we had when we were developing the new standards for long-term care is, is how to keep that perspective of those, you know, social determinants of health, uh, along with kind of the technical need around infection prevention and control. Um, and really the approach we took with was really um, by, you know, looking from the ground up, you know, we, we had a lot of people, a lot of uh, individuals who, as you said, have experience of someone in long-term care, uh, right to long-term care home operators and staff that really felt it was, it was truly important to try to, to have those components in any standard that was being developed. And I think that's going to be the way we're going to have to continue moving forward, is really from the ground up um, and really try to educate and convince uh, everyone involved in the long-term care sector the importance of of looking at these other aspects such as mental health. And um, to be honest, you know, from what we've experienced, it hasn't been a tough sell so far. I think, you know, the past three years has really opened up a lot of people's eyes to what's happening. The question is how to do it, right? Um, especially with limited staff, limited budgets, et cetera. So 
that is where the top down comes in. You know, now we need to convince the government, the policymakers that they need to provide the funding that is required to provide these additional resources. And I know this might not be in your scope, but why do you think that's been such a challenge? I mean, we all have loved ones who age and we ourselves will all age. <laughs> so you would think that we would all appreciate this as an important priority, yet the government hasn't adequately funded these homes. Uh, yeah. Why do you think that is? Do you have any sense of that? Um, yeah, you know, obviously yeah, I've not received any kind of specific uh, language or response from, from government officials on this. And but, you know, if you, if you look at what's happened historically in talking with long-term care home operators, and again, more importantly, the residents and the families themselves, um, you know, I think a lot of it comes down to, you know, what what in the past has has proven to be the largest cost savings to the healthcare system, right? And that's really been ensuring physical health um, and, you know, mental health really wasn't a big consideration. And so it's really has to be now a shift in, in thinking. Um, it also has to be a bit of, uh, you know, onus on us as researchers now also to prove and show the data that mental health can have, you know, in, in, in supporting mental health, again, not only of the residents, but the staff who work there and the caregivers obviously can really result in those massive cost savings as well. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's trying to work with all these partners to ensure that we get the data that we acquire, but also to tell the stories that are important. Um, you know, unfortunately, here in our province, we're kind of going a different way <laughs> these days. So, you know, it's it's I think it's going to be an ongoing challenge that we need to continue just to fight. Absolutely. Um, and I think these are some common themes we will be exploring throughout many aspects of health policy in the class. Um, but with mental health specifically in long term care, what what do you think are the main ingredients of improving mental health for residents as well as for their caregivers? What what could we be doing differently? Um, you know, and and, and it's not a, a lot of you know complexity in these solutions. In my opinion, you know, it comes down to things such as providing you know programming that keeps uh, those residents engaged. Again, provides that socialization aspect. Um, you know, providing a little bit of autonomy and in, in the, the feeling of independence to the residents as well, that they are still in control of their lives and, and their health care. And again, there's different ways of doing that, obviously. Um, but again, it also comes on things such as design, you know, designing spaces that allow for people to engage with their environments in a positive way. And that includes you know, from paint colors, like get rid of these like, you know, mint green and, and beige walls that you typically see in these long-term care homes uh, to things that are vibrant, you know, outdoor gardens, outdoor spaces. Um, the final thing I'll just say is one of the big things that was really eye-opening when we did a lot of our consultations to long-term care was, was cultural practices, right? You know, you know, a lot of cultures around mealtime, they want to be part of the meal preparation and sharing of their meals with their friends and family. That's not allowed in long-term care. Um, so again, providing spaces that allow that to happen in a safe manner, obviously, um, especially if there is some kind of infection or, or something that's happening within the, res the, the residence itself. But again, it's just these typical things. You know, these are, these are people's homes. Um, they're not hospitals, they're not uh, health care facilities while health care is being provided. They are their homes. And for many of them, as we know, they're the last homes they're going to live in. So we need to ensure that we keep that mentality as we as we move forward. And I think we did a good job of that in the development of the standard that we kind of really made sure that we're designing these as people's homes. I think that's such an important point. Um, do you see any hope on the horizon in terms of government appetite and willingness to act on some of these recommendations at either federal or provincial levels? Um, I really hope so. Um, you know, we, we've spoken to individual provinces and territories, and there's some that are far more supportive than others. Um, I think it, it's going to have to be a strong partnership between the, the federal and provincial and territorial governments, obviously. Um, you know, many of the provinces that we spoke to are, are very willing to 
uh, implement these standards and these practices, again, it comes down to money, unfortunately. And, you know, they need to just figure out where they're going to get that funding and that money from. Um, so, you know, we're going to continue to push and continue to, to talk to all levels of government, uh, even after the standards are released, you know, our work's not done. Um, and, you know, a lot of it's going to come down to that education piece, showing the research, showing the data. Um, and again, hopefully getting some really strong examples on board of homes that are going to implement these standards and we, so that we can show the government at the various levels, look, it's working. There's a difference here, right? So. Was there any looking into differences between private and public in terms of how they compare in the care that residents receive or is that not part of what you looked at? Yeah, so we did not get into that whole notion of private versus public. Um, you know, obviously there has been a lot of issues that have come to light during the pandemic uh, with respect to private care homes. And, um, and so, you know, that was that was something we did not want to uh, get involved and we did not want the the politics of that issue to be disrupting the work that we did. Uh, so in fact, on our team of experts who developed the policy, we did not include any long-term care homes or representatives in long-term care homes um, on that decision-making body. We consulted many, but we did not want to have that influence or that bias towards private versus public in the development of the standard. So the standards would apply to both? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, that makes sense. Um, okay, well, those are all the main questions I had for you. Are there any final thoughts or comments you would want a group of students studying health policy to know about these issues, anything that you feel important? Yeah, no, I think just the final comment is, you know, now's the time. I think, you know, we're, we're finally getting to that point where everyone is realizing that there is an issue here. Um, and, you know, what's the, you know, people say, um, you know, never not take advantage of a good crisis, you know, so to speak. And, I think, you know, yes, the past three years have been awful, but it has also providing us with the opportunity now to hopefully make some change. And so now's the time in terms of health policy really to to push these issues and to to try to think a little bit outside of the box and let's get a bit more creative in the in the policies that we're developing. And is there anywhere you would suggest students who are particularly passionate about this issue go to learn more about it or maybe to get involved? Uh, absolutely come to AgeWell. Um, any student can join AgeWell as a, an associate member, um, which gives them then full access to everything in the network, including our training program. Um, so feel free just to go to the website and you'll see the, the training or the students kind of uh, menu. And, you know, this is the place where we're, we're doing a lot of work in the policy space now as well. So fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you, Janet.